report out the Historic Sites Management Authority, or what we shortened to PASMA, are responsible for the management of three of the 11 places that form the Australian Condit Sites World Heritage Property, Port Arthur, Coal Mines and Cascades Female Factory Historic Sites. PASMA was created in 1987 to preserve and maintain the Port Arthur Historic Site, and archaeological research and monitoring formed a major part of the Port Arthur Conservation and Development Project, an initiative tasked with the conservation, restoration and interpretation of the site. Archaeological research and management remain key elements of PASMA's conservation work at all three sites. The first archaeological excavation occurred at Port Arthur in 1976, so as an organisation we have and are dealing with 43 years worth of archaeological data. One category that we've been focusing on lately is ferrous metal. Now I admit, I've never really been into rusty iron, but recently I have been introduced to the world of colonial metal enthusiasts, and boy am I glad they are out there. They have been quietly advocating for these things, the too heavy, the too rusty, the too unidentifiable, the it will just fall apart soon anyway, and this is great, because in their fragile and rusty glory, all of these things, from everyone's too hard basket, tell as much of a story as the pretty and the shiny things. In 2016, we completed our most recent set of archaeological research excavations, the laundry of the penitentiary structure. Located to the rear of the penitentiary, the laundry area had, during the penitentiary's occupation from 1856 to 1877, formed a focus of the activity, servicing the requirements of the convict population housed there. The 270 metre squared excavation was part of a suite of works within the penitentiary precinct, as part of which the building and its surrounding spaces have been stabilised and reinterpreted. The excavation of the laundry also formed part of a broader research project which is in part looking at convict industry. Key products from the industrial workshops at Port Arthur were a range of ferrous objects, in particular a range of nails, bolts and other architectural fittings. Part of our research is con concerned with the types of things being made by convicts, the methods by which they are making them, the quality of the products, and the comparison of these attributes of convict industry with those on the commercial sector. Our research therefore required obtaining data from a range of objects which often give archaeologists problems. Anticipating a large amount of architectural metal would be encountered in this particular excavation, two processes were implemented to give this vulnerable material the best chance of fulfilling life in research, low oxygen storage combined with radiography. As we all know, once metal is removed from the ground, the rate of corrosion increases exponentially. In an attempt to halt this, all metal and organic material was immediately placed in low oxygen storage. This involved sealing the object or group of objects in a bag and slowly flooding the bag with nitrogen. By removing all oxygen, this process effectively halted corrosion of metal or degradation of organics, buying five to ten years for data to be collected and decisions to be made about these objects. Initial use of radiography on the penitentiary project had been the well-known one, identifying mis mystery ferrous objects the form of which was obscured by concretions. For the laundry excavations, we expanded the use of radiography to all ferrous objects. We didn't need to identify some objects, but to retrieve data from all of them. Given the cost of physically removing concretions to allow identification and data recovery, and that in many cases this is not actually physically possible, we returned to, we turned to radiography in an attempt to achieve a number of things. What exactly was lurking below these concretions? What was the form and size of the objects and, if possible to establish, how had they been manufactured? This would give some measure of the range of items present, their degree of standardisation and the quality of convict labour. Distinguishing between imported and convict-made objects was probably going to require material analysis across the typologies of objects that had been used in the construction of the laundry buildings. Being able to sort concreted objects into types and size classes would enable an analytical program for the type we required and would be able to show us which concretion still retained sufficient original metal for that work to be undertaken. And this is where things got fun. It was like a mystery board game 
or a weird and messy game of Tetris. First, each object was secured to an A3 sized MDF board with a run of the mill hot glue gun. This was chosen above a more inert material like wax because it was being attached to the corrosion product rather than the actual surface of the object. Most of the metal was small, like nails, buttons, and small unidentified metal objects. So we averaged 50 to 80 objects per board. <coughs> a series of photographs with a scale were taken of the boards to ensure provenance information um, remained with the objects and to keep a record of the position of each object. Each board was placed in a customised and repurposed cardboard box, cushioned with sections of foam so it did not slip about during transport. Each box held four boards, the boards were numbered, and the board numbers were written on each box. Initially we included a scale, uh, a 10 cm brass rod, on the board, however after the first batch we realised that the software provided uh, includes a scale on the image as well as an inbuilt measuring tool. The boxes were then transported to the nearest radiology clinic, a 1.5 hour trip to Hobart in our case. These were x-rayed with varying exposure parameters as defined by the density of the objects. These ranged between 60 and 70 kilovolt and 5 and 8 milliampere per second. Initially, the x-rays were done during an appointment and we worked with the radiographer, trialling different exposures to get the best results. Once the radiographer recognised what we were looking for, we were able to leave batches of boxes at the clinic and they would be done in between patient appointments. The results were provided digitally on a CD with a viewing program. As Windows PC users, the programs for viewing the images were either Singo FastView or CareStream PAC. Extracting the images from these programs varied between saving JPEG or BMP images of what was shown on the viewing screen or pasting a screen grab into an image editing program. I hear it is slightly easier to extract the images if you're using a Mac. And as I mentioned previously, the software also allows for measurements of the objects. The digital images, rather than the boards of Rusty Ferris, were then sent to an artifact specialist to be catalogued. Initially, they were rather pleased, but after squinting at rows and rows of nails in black and white images, by tray 30, the novelty wore off. Now, it's still early days for us and we're still refining the method. While we have ensured to go about this in a consistent way, we have had variability in quality of results, which mainly is a result from different radiographers using different settings. It is critical to have a good relationship with the radiographer, and continuity is the key to achieving the best results. At the end of the day, though, this program gave us data that we didn't have before, and we probably wouldn't have got if we hadn't taken some kind of action. Um, has it achieved what we hoped? Absolutely. A total of 3,176 Ferris objects were x-rayed, of which identity was established for 95%. The majority, or 89% of the Ferris objects were nails, and for 76% of the nails, the manufacturing technology was also able to be identified. In addition, other hardware and tools were identified, including tacks, screws, spokes, hinges, brackets, and segments of saws and knives. So to obtain at least two points of data from every object cost about 50 cents per object. This meant that the entire artifact classes could be identified for the first time, integrated properly into our analyses for the first time, that significant objects could be identified and conservation targets could be identified based on knowledge of the entire assemblage and not just guesswork. The digital x-rays provide not only data on form and size, but rough guides to the state of the preservation of the objects shrouded in rust. Through this process, we can determine which corroded bumps are worthy of retention for further analysis into the future, and for which practical long-term storage solutions might be developed that would stabilise the objects. Although our focus was on data retrieval, we also recognised that radiography could provide us with information about objects that might be worthy of long-term conservation. Significant objects, those that were rare, particularly well-preserved examples, or with rare manufacturing methods, could be identified for conservation, long-term treatment management, or display. 
Once the catalogue was completed from the X-rays, we followed a triage system using significance criteria to identify objects that might need further work, such as additional radiography like a CT scan, deconcretion and conservation. Radiography not only enabled us to identify otherwise unidentifiable objects, but very importantly produced a digital record of basic data across the whole ferrous assemblage not recoverable by any other realistic means. By generating digital X-ray signatures of all objects, we are saving data as well as salvaging it, and saving it in a form that will not be subject to hidden changes or deterioration, and which will require less storage space, space and curation than if the still corroding objects themselves were physically retained. Perhaps it is easier, even more appropriate, to store 56 digital X-ray images than 56 balls in nitrogen when you consider that you are storing the same thing, you are storing data. Beyond identification, we think that the collection of this basic data is the real gem of the radiography process. The measurements of each object, its form, manufacture process and quality all stored digitally. The introduction of radiography into our archaeological research and management workflow at PASA has provided us with a tool for making informed decisions about a previously overlooked and problematic material type. A wise colleague recently said to me, a good collection is a sustainable collection. It is widely recognised and debated that our discipline has found itself in a collection crisis. Once excavated, the objects painstakingly and often expensively recovered are unlikely to see the light of day for a second time. So, we may not have solved the curation crisis or identified a realistic way to keep rusty things forever, but we have shown how we can reliably extract key data from previously problematic artefact types, better inform strategies for the retention of meaningful samples, identify significant objects worthy of conservation and curation, and make better decisions about whether to keep deteriorating objects or a reliable digital record of them.